Thanks. Thanks for the Thank you so much. <laughs> Thanks. Okay. Okay, press, you're all ready. Oh, can I count to five? One, two, three. Thanks for being here today. Um, as co-chair of the Joint Armed Services Committee, I just wanted to um, welcome our commanders um, from each of the four branches that are represented in the state of Alaska today. Um, I wanted to say that um, I can say on behalf of the committee and actually the entire legislature that, uh, that you folks, we're, we're proud to have you here. Um, we're proud that you work on behalf of our state and behalf of the nation. So thank you very much for that. Senator Costello. Thank you, and I want to thank the co-chair for the meeting today. Uh, this update from our commanders of the Alaska's Armed Services is really uh, helpful to the legislature, and certainly uh, what a tremendous um, pool of talent we have here in Alaska, and I want to thank you personally for what you do for our state and for our nation. Thank you. Thank you, and I know Senator Costello has a bill that she's got on the floor, and I'm trying to reduce the deficit up in House Finance Committee, but I will turn this over to Major General Hummel, uh, who will introduce the panelists. Once again, thank you. Well, I guess we should sit down. So, good afternoon, everyone. And uh, it is my pleasure, as uh, Alaska's Adjutant General and Commissioner of Department of Military and Veterans Affairs, uh, to introduce my mission partners, the commanders of the uh, other branches and components of service here in, in Alaska. So uh, first I'd like to introduce um, Lieutenant General Kenneth Wilsbach. Lieutenant General Wilsbach uh, actually wears three hats at one time. He is the commander of the Alaska region of uh, NORAD, the North American Aerospace Defense Command. He is commander of Alaskan Command, which is a joint command subordinate to NORTHCOM, or U.S. Northern Command. And he's also the commander of the 11th Air Force. His headquarters is uh, at Joint Base Elmendorf-Richardson. To General Wilsbach's right is Major General Brian Owens, General Owens is the commanding general of USARAC, United States Army, Alaska, and he's also stationed at J Bear on the Fort Richardson side. And sitting uh, to my immediate right is Rear Admiral Michael McAllister, who is the commander of the 17th U.S. Coast Guard District, and his uh, headquarters is just down the street from this building here in Juneau. And so now I believe that we are open to the field for questions, and there, we have a master of ceremonies, and I'd like to turn everything over to him. Hi, I'm uh, Tim Brander with Legislative Digest, and this is a question for General Owens. Uh, a couple of years ago, we heard a lot about the force drawdown at the 425th at J. Bear. Could you, and then we heard that that went on the shelf for a while. Could you give us a status of that? Is that still a pending policy, or... Are there any changes pending? Uh... No, thank you for your question. Um, the, the short answer is no for the next couple of years. Um, there are no force cuts. And so uh, the good news is that uh, 425 will remain a strong brigade combat team, airborne brigade combat team, um, for at least the next couple of years. And, uh, and then we'll see where it goes from there based on the budget, can, the national budget, and et cetera. And Austin Baird from KTUU, for anyone who'd like to answer, we've, we've been hearing for about a decade that the Real ID uh, Act uh, implementation, if it doesn't happen in Alaska, there will be you know, drastic impacts for travelers, for teachers, construction workers going on to military bases. Uh, what is your level of concern or sense of urgency as we look at the next set of deadlines? And also, could you maybe speak about who's impacted in the military community? I'll uh, answer first um, because yesterday as the commissioner of DMBA, I sent a letter out to all of our state employees uh, letting them know that on the 6th of June, the anniversary of D-Day, by the way, uh, they will no longer be able to enter a federal installation um, without uh, real ID compliant identification. 
So the headquarters of Department of Military and Veterans Affairs, which is a state agency, is at the National Guard Readiness Center, which is on Joint Base Elmendorf Richardson. And so the responsibility of all of our employees, uh, state employees as well, is that they, they have to uh, enable themselves to be able to come to work. And so that means that they have to get real ID compliant uh, identification. Uh, the lead time on a U.S. passport is about six to eight weeks. Uh, I suspect that there might be a rush coming from the state of Alaska. And so I encouraged all of my employees yesterday uh, to move hastily to get themselves a passport or some other form of uh, real ID compliant identification. Um, earlier today, General Wilsbach very rightly pointed out that uh, if you don't have real ID compliant identification, it doesn't mean you can't come on post uh, or base. It means that you have to be escorted. But uh, I will note that I had some friends recently from the state of Minnesota who were visiting uh, my husband and myself at Offutt Air Force Base, in Nebraska. And we not only had to provide an escort for those friends to get in the the gate of the base because minnesota is a uh, non real id compliant state with their licenses but that individual who was a military member had to stay with them the entire time they were on the base so as an employer of uh, of state workers uh, that's a non-starter for us Liz Rains with KTVA. I had a question for a Rear Admiral, Admiral McAllister. You'd mentioned the budget amendment um, that came out last week uh, that sustains the current level for Coast Guard uh, funding and wondering the impact of that for Alaska. Um, well, thank you for the question. Uh, on Thursday of last week, the Department of Homeland Security, uh, in which the Coast Guard works, uh, sent out a uh, press release uh, indicating that they had uh, submitted a revised budget that that, that uh, sustains the Coast Guard's current level of funding uh, into 2018, uh, which allows us to continue our, our current pace of day-to-day uh, -day operations and continue uh, to invest in uh, some of our recapitalization and critical infrastructure projects that are already underway. Um, so, uh, so with that budget, uh, I think in Alaska here we can expect uh, the, the service levels to be sustained. And as I noted to the committee uh, earlier today, uh, we actually are going to be the beneficiaries of a number of new assets uh, as part of the recapitalization program of the Coast Guard, including uh, new cutters and, and new aircraft in the coming years. How significant is it that that money was put back into the budget? Um, well, it's, 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 Probably not appropriate for me to speculate as to how we would have taken those cuts. Um, you know, it was very early in the budget process, and we hadn't uh, done all of the planning against uh, what that 13 percent uh, might have meant for the Coast Guard here in Alaska. Um, but um, as I think uh, was accurately portrayed um, in the uh, in uh, various uh, media sources, um, you know, the Coast Guard is a fairly thin organization, and there would have been uh, some operational impacts here. Andrew Kitchenman, Alaska Public Radio Network. Um, are you concerned about North Korea, whether it could potentially reach Alaska with a missile soon, and does that keep you up at night? Um, so I'll take that one, Andrew. Um, General Wilsbach from... Uh, Alaska NORAD region as well as Alaskan Command. So I think um, we talked about this earlier in the committee meeting, a very similar question uh, was asked, and um, we all have watched the media, and of course uh, those of us in military have intelligence reports that um, you know back the, what the media is reporting. Um, the nuclear aspirations of North Korea as well as their aspirations to develop inter intercontinental ballistic missiles that certainly you know, if they're successful, could reach the United States and also many of our partners um, around the world, um, specifically those in, in the Pacific. And so um, that has us and our partners very concerned. And so, um, so we, we are watching that extremely closely. And so as we go forward, um, we certainly um, will hope that North Korea chooses a different path. Um, and we hope that um, potentially 
uh, the partners in the Pacific region um, and maybe some that aren't our partners, uh, perhaps China, uh, may be able to encourage North Korea to take a, a less provocative path. You know, I'd, I'd like to add on to that. Uh, your question was, are we concerned? But I'd like to take it a little bit further and say we're trained and ready. Um, when you take a look at, we have the northernmost uh, striker brigade combat team in the Army, um, the only active duty uh, striker brigade combat team. They just completed a rotation at the National Training Center and probably, I would dare say, uh, the best trained organization in the Army at this point. And then um, for 425, as we talked, 425 is healthy and they're headed to a Joint Readiness Training Center in June. Uh, but again, the only airborne uh, beast brigade combat team in the Asia Pacific Theater. And as you know, this is a strategic location and we're pretty close and we're tied in very closely with the Air Force here and have the assets we need to deploy if we need to. And you just heard a very powerful argument for why our active component army should never be downsized in Alaska. Um, Nat Hers with Alaska Dispatch News. Good afternoon. Um, I was wondering for uh, General Hummel, uh, can, can you just clarify is the, um, the, the real ID requirements, is it uh, actually state workers' responsibility to, you know, have compliant IDs if their driver's license aren't going to work anymore, and if they don't have them, is that, you know, are they, is that, is that their problem, not the state's problem? Well, it's every, uh, it's every employee's responsibility to be able to get to the workplace. What happens if you know someone doesn't have a passport by the certain date? You know, we have, uh, we have very. Uh, professional, forward-thinking and forward-leaning employees in DMVA, and uh, I know that they're watching the news and they are aware of the situation that they potentially are in, and uh, I know that, um, you know, their, their leaders have been talking to everyone about, you know, what's potentially coming forward on June 6th, and so uh, I'm very optimistic that everyone is doing what they need to do to make sure that they still have base access. Would you guys like? Would you guys all, all characterize this as sort of something? If the state doesn't come into compliance, that's going to be like a big headache, or is does this sort of rise to the level where it's going to sort of create gridlock and and really hinder your guys' ability to to do your jobs? Well, from uh, the perspective of DMVA, you know, if June seventh comes uh, and we have onesies and twosies of individuals who have applied for passports or other identification and, and just haven't received them yet, we will do everything that we can uh, to dispatch someone to the front gate to escort them in and to remain compliant uh, with uh, the 673rd Airborne uh, Air Base Wing's uh, responsibility to keep the base safe. Um, I would say that, you know, the longer we go down that path of having to escort, uh, continuously escort individuals who uh, don't carry a uh, compliant ID, the, the bigger of a problem it would become. I agree. The, uh, the, 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 back, the, bases, uh, the basis of this um, escort is that the escorts, as uh, General Hummel described, have regular jobs you know so if they're escorting then they're not doing their job and so it has a mission impact for for sure um, and then it also if we we can't get the for example the construction workers at Ielson Air Force Base um, to build the uh, facilities for the F-35 if there's a slowdown there and we get behind schedule um, then that's a significant problem for um, the Air Force to install the, uh, the F-35 and so we're going to do everything we can to make sure that we 